I conceive of the book, I think it's best understood as doing uh, for contemporary science what Kant did for Newtonian science. Um, and uh, that means that this is a book of philosophy of metaphysics to accompany uh, complexity theory or nonlinear mathematics or uh, dynamic systems theory, you can take your pick. And the key difference will be that Kant works on the basis of reversible linear time, and Deleuze and Guattari are going to be working with uh, irreversible or nonlinear time. So that's the, that's the basis on which this contrast uh, would unfold. So I'm considering this a book of metaphysics, including um, uh, an ontology. Metaphysics in the sense that it is beyond any particular science, but draws on the sciences of its day in order to uh, encompass them and present, um, present its positions. One of the things that is important about the uh, irreversible nature of time in Deleuze and Guattari is that there's a radical asymmetry of the future vis-a-vis -vis the past. And um, this is in part drawn from Bergson, but only in part. Um, from Bergson, Deleuze and Guattari borrow the notion or draw the notion that the, the entire past exists as a contemporaneous block. It's not as if the past exists on some kind of line. I don't have to replay all of the last two weeks to get back to what happened two weeks ago. I just, just go right there. Um, but in addition, um, from Bergson, the understanding that any entity is its history, is a contraction of the process that brought it into being. And in fact, that drawing on Leibniz here, the, any entity is in fact a contraction of the entire history of the entire cosmos. So the themes of becoming and being are very important to this book throughout uh, and throughout Deleuze's work. Uh, the molecular and the molar are understood in this way as intensive processes that are becoming and <laughs> islands or temporary stases of being in relation to those processes. So in this view uh, of an asymmetrical temporality where the past is a contemporaneous block and the future is, uh, is radically uncertain, um, in effect, you never know when or if you're at a bifurcation point. And so, um, and so uh, time is, is in that sense irreversible. You can't simply go back, backwards and forwards in time um, the way you could in a linear temporal system. So this is one of the key things that differentiates the metaphysics of the lesson point that we present here uh, from the contrasting metaphysics in Kant. The other I, I characterize in terms of self-organization or imminence, or some, what's sometimes called a flat ontology. Kant had replaced God with man in his critique. Deleuze and Guattari will in turn replace man with life. But life itself is uh, in turn situated in relation to the cosmos in a way that we'll see in just a moment. But um, What's important for Deleuze and Guattari is to find the same kinds of processes at work in all these different levels, the cosmos itself, life, and so forth. These different strata, or what I will call phyla, because there are lots of strata, um, and there are three major phyla that Deleuze and Guattari talk about in the Gods and Plateaus, um, these three phyla operate according to the same principles. Um, it's true that experimentation becomes important to these processes only in the, um, in the, the later phyla, or the phyla I will get to later in my presentation. Um, and experimentation becomes a very important theme for the Lose But nonetheless, um, the strata, generally speaking, with the exception of experimentation, work according to the same principles. And uh, these principles of self-organization Deleuze and Guattari refer to as abstract machines. Now, abstract machines are one of at least three kinds of machines that they, uh, they talk about with some regularity throughout the Thousand Plateaus. Two of them are concrete machines. And by machines, you have to keep in mind a kind of Rube Goldberg machine. It's a, a set of connections, of operative connections. That's uh, 
uh, that's what a machine um, means for the listening broderie. And so you have the two concrete machines that they talk about, uh, the machinic assemblage of desire and the collective assemblage of enunciation, which are related to one another. And then you have the act abstract machines, which may be virtual or may be intensive, to, work, to use the term that, uh, that Manuel Valandi uses for this. And what's abstract about these machines is that the same processes apply to very different kinds of materials, or they apply on different, uh, different strata for different kinds of contents. And we'll look at these uh, in a moment. Now, it may be that um, double articulation is the process that's common to all abstract machines. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, some people claim it is. But um, the abstract machine can also be understood in relation to what the structuralists call structures, an assemblage of parts that work together, except that for Deleuze and Guattari, unlike structural, for Saussure and structural linguistics, a structure is never fixed. It's always an event, or it's always part of a process. And so uh, the notion of imminent causality was developed um, for uh, <coughs> understanding the way structures uh, influence their, the parts of structures is a very important uh, way of thinking about abstract machines. Now, um, one of the reasons that abstract machines are important is that um, becoming is not a, an indeterminate process for the lizard weapon. It occurs always within constraints. And uh, we can imagine that the virtual plane of consistency that uh, Deleuze and Guattari uh, used to describe the potential of uh, processes in the, in the cosmos um, is populated by events or by structures or by sets of abstract machines that determine what's possible in uh, processes of becoming and what kinds of beings can emerge out of those processes of becoming. So um, the plane of consistency, which is the potential that the, the cosmos presents, is not indeterminate, um, but it's always richer in, po in potential than any actualization. Any process that results in beings and entities in fixed structures is always poor relative to the processes of becoming and the potential on the plane of consistency from which it uh, came into being. So these are the two characteristics, ir um, irreversible time and self-organization, that seem to me to be the key features of the metaphysics that, um, that uh, Deleuze and Guattari will operate uh, under, um, drawn largely from uh, contemporary science, but also from philosophical sources, some of which I've mentioned. So this is the chaosmos. Uh, the process of chaosmosis that they refer to, and that um, gives them a starting point or a point of departure for the philosophical work they will do. Um, this is importantly uh, different from the view that derives from the second law of thermodynamics, operating on closed systems with no inputs of energy, where entropy prevails. In open systems, where there's a positive net inflow of energy, you can have self-organization. Uh, and that's, um, that's the, uh, the, the, I think, the cornerstone of, um, of, their, of the metaphysics they're proposing. So uh, the plane of consistency is finitely infinite in the, in the potential that it harbors for becomings and for beings. And we know that this universe has constants or constraints according to which it operates. And so the kinds of beings that come into being, the form of life that exists and so forth, all correspond to um, the, the constraints of, uh, of the cosmos as, as best we know it. Now, the three phyla that they then present, given this uh, overall metaphysics, are uh, the inorganic, the organic, and the alloplastic. And they operate according to three different principles, induction, transduction, and translation, which I probably will not get to, uh, to talk much about today. But these, um, these uh, three phyla operate in some ways according to the same principles and in some ways uh, differently. So the first, um, the first or, or inorganic phylum uh, starts with the Big Bang, which produces in a first instant a homogeneous mass or plasma. 
which very soon, because of swerves and uh, eddies and so forth, begins to differentiate itself and the elements begin to consolidate out of this initial plasma. So you have the first instance of uh, differentiation occurring and corresponding to that, uh, eventually the consolidation of elements, um, helium, hydrogen, and so forth. Uh, and um, eventually these eddies will, will begin to coalesce into stars. So you have a process where differentiation and contraction or consolidation are the rule. And that's a familiar uh, pairing. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari often talk about the, the systolic and the diastolic as one way of understanding this, this process of, uh, of differentiation and consolidation that they say characterizes um, uh, chaos, chaos -mosis. Um, and of course, among those uh, elements that get uh, formed in the compression of stars is carbon. And uh, that, that consolidation is also a differentiation because carbon is a different element than the others from which it was derived. And so uh, in the development of the uh, inorganic phylum, you have uh, eventually a geological <coughs> stratum which develops um, locally for us. <coughs> Um, and uh, it operates also according to these same processes of, of differentiation and consolidation. And this is particularly um, evident in the geology of Morals Plateau, where Deleuze and Padre talk about uh, sedimentation and so forth uh, as one of the processes that produces the, um, the geological as a, as a context or as a stratum for, uh, for, for eventually for life. And before we get to life, before we get to the, um, the next, uh, the organic phylum, you have organic chemistry which differentiates itself from inorganic chemistry. And then we have um, a second phylum, um, which is uh, life itself. And here, uh, self-organization uh, takes, as it were, a kind of quantum leap. You still have the same pattern of differentiation and consolidation, but evolution makes this uh, a far more um, dynamic process and a far speedier one. Each of these phyla operate on a different time frame, which is one of the reasons that the plateaus are dated according to very different time scales. Um, and life will accelerate the process of differentiation and consolidation considerably. So you have famously random mutation and ecological selection as the principles according to which uh, evolution will um, will uh, in this rhythm produce um, uh, different new, new life forms. But uh, life is also self-expanding in a new way, so that you have a kind of experimentation conducted by life. Uh, it's possible to read this back to the inorganic phylum. I'm not sure what the advantage would be, but certainly life at a more rapid pace is going to be um, sending out probe heads to, to see if a given life form that arrives, that arises from random mutation actually can, can take, finds an ecological niche where it can, uh, it can survive, reproduce, and eventually uh, mutate itself and so forth. So life adds this quality of experimentation uh, and this self-expansion, which will be important themes for, for later strata. Um, brand new mutation continues the process of differentiation, but you now have mixed or differential success based on whether a given life form can, uh, can uh, succeed and reproduce in a given uh, ecological environment. So living is a form of problem posing that evolution solves, if you will. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the reasons that they are um, so, so interested in, in this form of, um, of the process of diastolic and systolic chaosmosis. Then, within that organic phylum, there's a very, um, a very important watershed. Some species, but not all, organize socially. And this is a very important category for Deleuze and Guattari. Not all species do. This is a local problem, then, if you will. But it is a problem that's very germane to a uh, human being, which is uh, a species that also organizes socially. But we're by no, no means the only one. So this problem of intraspecies social organization is one which they'll treat in some detail in a number of different plateaus. <coughs> so we have then a number of different solutions that life throws up to the problem of 
intraspecies social organization. Insects represent one, governed largely by instinct, or certainly by comparison with the other modes, governed by instinct. Cattle is an, another version of social organization that uh, is significant for the Les Brotherie, the herd. Birds are very important for them because of a number of different behaviors, including bird songs, territories, although Therapeutic is the only species that operate according to territories, wolves do too. And flocking is a very important, uh, significant form of social behavior that birds uh, exhibit. And will be, although I'm not sure we'll get to it today, have interesting ramifications for the way certain markets operate in certain conditions. So these, these solutions to the problem of interspecies social organization are significant for the lesson because humans attempt to address or solve these problems can be read in relation to these other solutions that life has thrown up in the course of evolution. So uh, life as a whole, if we could say, learns um, <coughs> from its experimentation with different life forms, some of which succeed, some of which don't. But then there's another watershed where learning devolves to individual organisms <coughs> and species. And so we have a whole another another order of magnitude uh, where learning becomes important. So, for example, um, wolves learn social roles from a broader repertoire of behaviors that they engage in as pups, and that that period of play and experimentation at the individual level will then produce uh, results, controlled results, when the pups grow up to participate in the pack and learn to hunt together and so forth and so on. So this is a very important uh, transition from <coughs> learning as a characteristic of life as a whole, where species are experiments, to uh, a, a different scale where uh, actual behaviors are the experiments, and it's the context of the pack, in the case of wolves, and the environment in which the wolves find themselves that determine which behaviors will be uh, retained, selected, and which behaviors will be left behind. very different from the kind of instinctual programming that characterizes the insect solution to the ISSO, to the intraspecies social organization problem, right? Where roles are determined very strictly and behaviors are very limited in scope, ants, bees, and so forth, termites. <coughs> but you'll recall, perhaps, that Deleuze and Guattari insists that art does not wait for humans to begin and this is a theme, I think, that also applies not just to art, but to a much broader set of, um, of components of social organization, modes of social organization, behaviors, and so forth. So already, uh, with wolves and others, other, uh, other species, uh, learning has devolved to individuals. <coughs> then we get then next to the uh, alloplastic phylum. This is not the same thing as human being. Uh, the Lisbon Guattari want to insist that birds, for example, have culture. Uh, wolves have culture. Um, so, but when we get to the alloplastic phylum, there are a whole other set of solutions to the problem of interspecies social organization that become uh, relevant to eventually examining uh, the human, uh, the human problem of, of uh, interspecies social organization. So territori territorialization is one mode. Uh, it's particularly um, evident in birds, in their discussion of, of birds and, and the marking of territory in the refrain plateau. But there, of course, there are any number of species that mark territory. Wolves do too, for example. And then do it in different ways. And, but it's definitely one address of the problem of how to organize a species to be a social, uh, to be a social species. So territorialization is definitely one of those solutions, and, uh, and yet deterritorialization is, according to the metaphysics of Lisbon Guattari, the primary movement of, um, of, the, uh, of the cosmos. So um, <coughs> territorialization, although it will remain important, will not be considered to be the primary, um, the primary basis for human social organization. And so the sedentary state will always be viewed 
relative to deterritorialization rather than territorialization. Uh, there's no privilege given to territorialization just because other species engage in it. Right? So, uh, deter so we have territorialization, deterritorialization, and reterritorialization as movements that will uh, impact the way humans address the problem of uh, intraspecies intra -species social organization. Packs and herds, borrowed from cattle and wolves, for example, are another set of parameters that uh, Lizzie Bothery will refer to, which, um, which um, intersect to some extent with the distinction between nomads and the sedentary state as two different, two different axes of a social organization uh, in, in their view of, of the human addressed to this problem. But the market is another solution to the problem of human social organization, often not understood as such because much of the discussion of social organization is addressed directly to the difference between nomad war machines and, and the sedentary state. But nonetheless, the division of labor, the articulation of labor, is a very important component of the way the human species addresses, not to say solves, the problem of interspecies social organization. And it's particularly important, the market, as one component of the human solution to this problem, because of the way it gets catalyzed by capital and becomes self-expanding, just the way life becomes self-expanding on the organic farm. So, um, so if, when we finally get to the, the problem of the human address to the interspecies uh, social organization problem, you have a number of parameters uh, in, a, in, 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 in play. You have the state form versus the nomad war machine. You have a number of social forms, which are outlined first in Antoedipus, but then get borrowed and, and altered for, uh, for a thousand plateaus. These are synthetic, synthetic categories that they are, they are, they are um, types. Types of social organization that have a number of different components. Um, they are the primitive solution, uh, which um, involves cruelty and uh, a, 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 a territorial connection to the earth, and a patchwork of debts that are never infinite, that are always temporary. You have the despotic uh, solution, which is the imperial state, where um, the territorial has been deterritorialized largely because of tribute money. And um, instead of cruelty, you have terror imposed by the despot. And you have a debt that now has become infinite. And that's part of what's ter terrifying about the despot. Debts are no longer payable. They are now infinite and always directed at the, at the, at the uh, despot. The third solution they discuss is the modern or liberal capitalist state solution. It is expansive. It also is characterized by infinite debt. It has sub-solutions that, uh, that are outlined in uh, various parts of the Thousand Plateaus. Uh, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, and fascism is a kind of um, mediator, a vanishing mediator between uh, different uh, state forms and their relations to capital. So these are, the, uh, these are some of the uh, ideal types, if you will, or some of the types of uh, social formation that uh, Deleuze and Bartholdi analyze as different solutions that have been uh, thrown up by the human species in its, uh, in its attempts to organize socially. At the same time that you have uh, these three types of social formation, you have a number of components. And this is one of the shifts from Anti-Oedipus to Thousand Plateaus. Uh, in um, Anti-Oedipus, it's the modes of libidinal production that prevail, the primitive, the barbarian, the civilized, is what they're called in Antioedipus. In uh, A Thousand Plateaus, those are still there in a shadowy way, but much more important now are the analytic components that they uh, think need to be uh, used to analyze any social formation, any and all social formations. So you have a set of analytic categories um, that um, underlie the, the synthetic categories drawn from Antioedipus. And among these components are regimes of signs, um, the importance of language as a symbolic system, um, 
you have uh, the pre-signifying, the signifying, the post-signifying, and the counter-signifying. These don't intersect exactly with the former modes of lipid mineral production from Oedipus, but they come close. You also have, uh, in addition to uh, regimes of science, you have apparatuses of capture, including, this is this, the money is a symbolic um, uh, implement. Uh, you have rent, uh, tribute, taxation, and profit as the three forms of capture. Now, um, the, um, these two forms of what I'm calling symbolic, uh, the symbolic, are important uh, because they differentiate the way that human beings learn and adopt social roles and organize socially, distinguish that from uh, the way other species do. And so um, this symbolic as a category is a place where uh, the human begins to differentiate itself more um, from the other species' ways of addressing this problem. <coughs> Part of this has to do with the way the different phyla um, over, get overcoated. The first, the inorganic phylum, um, the abstract machine working on the inorganic phylum uh, operates by what they call induction, uh, by which they mean that the processes that determine the formation of, of, of form and matter are on the same level as the form and matter itself. So the same processes uh, produce um, the matter and the forms. When you get to the organic phylum, you have, with the genetic code, a differentiation of the overcoding expression from the matter that it's overcoding. And yet it's operating according to the same chemical principles. So you have what they call a transduction instead of an induction. The third level, which is the, um, the level of the human uh, and the symbolic, you have now uh, language and money as means of expression that are farther, much farther from the matters they're organizing. They're of a different order. And so uh, there's a st this is the sense in which the symbolic comes to play an important role on this, in this phylum in a way that uh, distinguishes it from the, uh, from the two others. So um, much, of the, um, much of the book of Thousand Plateaus then is devoted to this problem, the problem of how humans organize themselves as a social species. But there's another part of the, another, another aspect of the book which has to do with how human lives, a human life, self-organizes, not on the social but uh, on, the, on the individual level. And here questions are asked such as how to make yourself a body without organs. This is one of the plateaus, the title of one of the plateaus. And the imperative here is to experiment, to evaluate, to pursue lines of deterritorialization and see what they produce. Um, they also uh, <coughs> delineate the, the types of body without organs that exist and the dangers that, uh, that, uh, that accrue to different ones. Um, deterritorialization and reterritorialization is, is the means of experimentation. This is the way one uh, experiments with life and figures out what works and what doesn't. Um, The book outlines a whole set of strata, uh, not just the phyla, which are the huge strata, but a number of, of much more specific uh, strata, such as language systems, um, uh, markets, and so on. Um, and yet, for those by three, it's always destratification that is primary and that has to be pursued. So uh, they they are in this work trying to outline what's what strata we live in, how strata are organized, but always with a view to understanding how destratification can take place from any given strata and how it can be made productive. So the lines of flight that take off from strata are what they, what they um, are suggesting we experiment with uh, and evaluate according to whether or not they produce uh, good results. And this has to be weighed against the mapping of the strata themselves, because um, partly perhaps in an attempt to ward off 
misinterpretations of the notion of schizophrenia than was characteristic of anti-Oedipus. Here they, um, they promote a kind of caution and, and recommend a kind of care in understanding the strata in which human beings live but not for its own sake, so as to be able to de-stratify in a way that, uh, that is productive rather than destructive. And so in addition to the, um, to the body with our organs um, as a category, refrains and segmentar segmentarity are, um, are tools that enable us to understand how it is that human life is stratified and what are the possibilities for escaping those uh, those, strata, those strata. So it should be possible with this understanding of the, what the book is doing, generally speaking, to look at each of the plateaus, uh, the 14 or 15 of them that, uh, that, um, that are there, to determine what, um, what, is, what is being c contributed by that plateau to this project. So you have three plateaus which um, are aimed at defining the image of thought according to which they, uh, they are operating and are recommending that we operate. The first plateau uh, and the last plateau, the first plateau called rhizome and the last plateau before the conclusion, uh, which is called smooth and striated, present images of thought um, that, uh, and that recommend, for example, rhizomatic connections rather than arborescent uh, routing and so forth. Um, and similarly, the smooth and striated plateau outlines the differences between smooth space and striated space in a number of different fields, mathematics and so forth. And then there's a, uh, a passage in the nominology plateau, which is also devoted to two uh, different images of thought that they call royal science and nomad science, or minor science. And uh, they associate uh, royal science with uh, state thought or sedentary thought, and um, counterpose uh, nomad science or minor science as something more akin to what they are doing themselves. Now, there's, um, there's a considerable amount of overlap between what they call nomad or minor science in the nomadology plateau and the way they will later describe philosophy in what is philosophy. What is philosophy? The last collaborative work they wrote delineates very sharply and perhaps too sharply between philosophy, science, and the arts as different vehicles for thought or different medium of thought. And I say too sharply because the image of, uh, of science given in, the, in what is philosophy is often considered to be uh, much less sophisticated than what is at play in A Thousand Plateaus. Nonetheless, I think it's possible uh, in the section on, um, on uh, nomad and royal science in, uh, in the A Thousand Plateaus, in the Nomadology Plateau, to suggest that um, the tasks they consider to be philosophical align very closely with those of nomad science. Nomad science is differentiated from royal science by being based on problematics rather than axiomatics. The idea is not to is not to present a representation of the world that is complete as possible, but rather to develop enough knowledge or know-how to address a specific problem in a specific context. So problematics versus axiomatics is one of the ways they distinguish between nomad science and royal science in the nomadology plateau, and that kind of problematic orientation is the way they characterize philosophy in what is philosophy. So, Rhizome, smooth versus striated, the distinction between nomad and royal science are the plateaus or parts of plateaus that are devoted uh, to the image of thought, to developing an image of thought that will enable us, in Deleuze and Poitier's view, to address the problems uh, of human life uh, that we encounter. Now, the geology of morals plateau, not surprisingly, is the plateau devoted to uh, developing the metaphysics of the inorganic uh, phylum or stratum. Um, and uh, that's its focus. That's where you um, get the picture of the abstract machines and the way um, 
they operate on mostly on inorganic matter. The, the uh, plateau on the refrain, in turn, um, is lays out the metaphysics of the organic uh, of the organics of phyla. But already there's some there's some discussion of the alloplastic phylum because of the way refrains get deterritorialized, even in the case of bird songs. So territorialization and deterritorialization are already at play uh, in the organic uh, phylum. And so the refrain, refrain plateau reflects both of those aspects, the territorialization and the deterritorialization. But those two plateaus, geology of morals and on the refrain, are the ones that set out, lay out the metaphysics of the inorganic and the organic phylum. Um, when we turn then to the specificity of the human problem of interspecies social organization, uh, which is um, a, pr a principal focus of theirs, you have at least four plateaus that are devoted to, uh, to this. Um, the plateau on faciality, the plateau on regimes of signs, postulates of linguistics, and apparatuses of capture. These are, the, these are the plateaus that, that, um, that address the symbolic as an important component of uh, the, uh, the way the human species addresses the problem of interspecies social organization. And it includes, obviously, both uh, the coded visuality of the human face, which is a very important category for them, both in terms of the way uh, the human brain develops in infancy and in the way representational forms like painting um, operate with the recognizable features of, of the human face. So you have the, um, the, the, uh, the coding of the face as an important uh, aspect of the symbolic order for them, but also obviously sign systems as another aspect of the symbolic, and uh, the money system or uh, different, different versions of money as, uh, as another component of the symbolic in the apparatus of capture plateau. Then there are two additional plateaus that deal more directly with politics, which is one category, which um, obviously is a one way of understanding the, uh, the problem of social organization in the human species. Here, the nomenology plateau is very important. Obviously, it lays out the primary distinction between nomads, the nomad war machine, and the sedentary state as two different um, forms of social uh, organization. And uh, the plateau um, on micro micropolitics and segmentarity also addresses the, um, the question of, of how um, of how human social organization takes place on the molecular level and on the molar level at the same time. So uh, between the four plateaus devoted to the symbolic order and the two plateaus devoted to politics, you have the central, um, perhaps the central concern of the book, which is to understand um, human social organization. But you also have four additional plateaus that address the human subject and how the human subject self-organizes. Uh, and so if the, uh, if the nomenology plateau and the uh, micropolitics plateau uh, deal explicitly with politics, you have then a set of plateaus, four of them, which deal with ethics uh, and the subject. And they are um, the plateau devoted to uh, one or many wolves, which is their, um, their look back to the importance of psychoanalysis in anti Oedipus. And in some ways, they are saying goodbye to, to, to psychoanalysis because they've, uh, they've, they've decided that they've gotten as much out of it as they can. Uh, interestingly, they, they use schizoanalysis, which was the major category of anti Oedipus, uh, a number of times in A Thousand Plateaus. They say it's the same thing as rhizomatics, it's the same thing as nomenology, for all intents and purposes, these, they say pragmatics and so on. These are uh, synonyms for them. But they also say uh, in an interview that they have moved away from schizophrenia and schizoanalysis because they thought it privileged one line of flight or one mode of destratification to the detriment of too many others. So now schizoanalysis is just one tool uh, arrayed next to a whole, uh, alongside a, a, a larger set of them that enable us to address uh, questions of politics and ethics. So uh, one or many wolves is the first of the plateaus that deals with ethics and subjectivity. 
obviously, how to make yourself a body by the organs is another plateau directly addressing uh, the ethical uh, stratum. You have a very curious plateau um, devoted to the novella as a genre, which, is all, which also turns out to be about uh, the way individuals occupy strata and pursue lines of flight and so forth. So that's a third of the plateau, uh, the four plateaus that deal with ethics. And of course, the, 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 uh, the plateau on becomings is, uh, is also directly addressed to how humans can self-organize in a way that um, maximizes the potential for successful destratification and for pursuing productive lines of flight. So that's, um, that's the way I would map out um, this, uh, the, the, the book, um, and the metaphysics presents, and the, and the reason it presents the, um, the metaphysics it does as a way of addressing uh, what it considers to be, what they consider to be uh, pressing problems of politics and ethics and economics, for that matter. Um, but it's also worth saying uh, something about how the book is written and how it works. Um, I started off saying that uh, one of the important features of, uh, a distinguishing feature of the metaphysics they present is the notion of nonlinear temporality uh, by contrast with, um, with Kant and with Newton. And I think that uh, a sure explanation for organization according to plateaus is precisely this. There are still, there's still a temptation, I think it's a wrong-headed one, to interpret the anti-Oedipus in terms of linear temporality. Um, whether or not that's um, a mistaken interpretation, I think it's certain that when they get to a thousand plateaus, they set the plateaus up in such a way that because they operate on different time scales, because there's no linearity to the chronology of the dates and so forth, that they are intentionally trying to signal the departure from any, any remnant of linear temporality. So you have um, a thousand plateaus, you have a number of plateaus which are not linear uh, in, their, in their organization, at least they're in, in their chronological uh, orientation. But it's also interesting to consider why they would uh, use the, the word plateau rather than strata, uh, because in some ways strata and plateaus are, um, are, uh, are synonymous for them. But one thing that's important about plateaus versus strata is that there's a danger, I think, of conceiving of strata as piling up one on top of the other in a fixed order. And they want to, they want to, dis, uh, they want to distance themselves from that view. So plateaus, you imagine, are just areas that can interconnect and that are, that are connected in some subterranean sense. Um, Edward B. Saw is one of, the, uh, one of the interesting theorists influenced by A Thousand Plateaus, and he likes the image of the archipelago to, to, uh, to talk about the way these, these plateaus, or these topics of examination, appear separate on the surface, but in fact are linked um, beneath the sea in some ways. And so, these plateaus are supposed to be distinctive, and yet they are interconnected in a way that they, um, their, their, their concepts can be uh, transported from one to the other. So um, that's one thing about the way the book is written. Um, I've explained already that they, they, they um, consider philosophy to be a problematic uh, discipline. That is to say, it's not developing a picture of the world. It's addressing problems, and again, the plateaus are focused, each one, on a specific problem in that way. Um, for each of these problems, uh, a set of concepts are created, uh, regimes of signs here, types of body blood organs there, and so forth, so that um, they, um, they each produce their own constellation of concepts, which are nonetheless connected in some ways um, with one another. And perhaps most important, and this is, um, if you think about uh, the, uh, the geology of morals plateau, this is particularly, um, I think, germane. They claim that they're not writing about the world, but they're trying to write with the world. Their understanding of what a book is is not a representation of something. 
but an object in the world that has a certain operating principle just like any other object does. And so um, they're trying to write with the world instead of about it. And I mentioned the geology of, Plat of morals plateau because um, it's actually voiced by a fictional character from a, a Conan Doyle story, Lost World, right? Professor Challenger. And so the place that they are most um, directly presenting a metaphysics, it's the metaphysics of the inorganic phylum, uh, for, in, which, for, which is where they start in a way, they're, pre they're presenting this in the, in, the, in the voice of a fictional character, and so they're, they're, uh, they're distancing themselves from making any representational claims and instead are trying to create a conceptual constellation that enables us to find out what's significant, interesting, and important about the ways human beings have solved um, the problems, ways that are both successful and unsuccessful in, in their evaluation. So they talk about the book being an assemblage with what is outside of it, rather than an image of what is outside of it. They're trying not to be non-representational. And they even suggest that the book, um, any book, has its own bodies without organs. It has its own space of connection with operations that go on outside of it, forces, passions, affects, and so forth, going on outside of it. And so what their hope is is that uh, the book is going to operate like a machine to, uh, to map strata that we inhabit and also to map the lines that lead away from those strata that can be productively pursued uh, in, in the ex experimentation that they, that they recommend. So that's, um, that's what I take to be the, the, um, the thrust of the way the book is produced, uh, which is quite unusual and which at some points is quite um, uh, unsettling when you have uh, uh, a, what looks like a piece of metaphysics being presented in the, in the mouth of a fictional character, for example. So I will stop there.